Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faith, on kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, and never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Our Lady of Guadalupe, St. Joseph, Father Lanteri, St. Ignatius, St. Faustina, St. Margaret Mary Alacook, all God's angels and saints. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I'd like to cover uh, five basic points this morning. First of all, uh, your, uh, your prayer. Uh, to be able to pray well, it's very important that you have a determination that you're going to spend the time in prayer. Okay, so you have to, from the very outset, make sure that you give the Lord time to pray. Okay? Uh, the sheets that you're given, they're not overly complicated. You want to find some time, some place, and some method to be able to pray. So the most important part of this program is the time you're spending in prayer uh, every day, at least five times a week. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you that it's easy, rather it's challenging. It's very challenging to pray well. Uh, I'll, I'll ask all of you to beg for this grace now. I can teach you how to pray. I can. I can teach you how to pray, but I cannot give you the desire to pray. I can't give that to you. So I can teach you how. But the desire to pray, you have to beg for that. So beg for that grace today that you'll want to spend some time with the Lord in prayer. That's key. That's the key. So uh, let's, just, let's just go through uh, what would be a typical prayer time for you. Get up in the morning, maybe you say your morning offering, maybe you have breakfast, and then you, know, you give yourself 25 minutes and a half an hour. You have to have a place. In other words, you have to have your own prayer corner where you're going to be praying at. So you really can't be praying where there's a lot of, there's a lot of noise. You can't pray. To find the place uh, in your home, or it could be maybe if you've got a house, maybe your backyard where there's silence, if you want to come in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that's even better. You have to have a place where there's silence. Because if there's a lot of noise, you can't hear God speaking to you. Then you have to warm up to prayer. Any of you play sports you know before you hit the soccer field or the baseball field, whatever, you first have to warm up. Otherwise, you pull a muscle or a hamstring and you're out for two months. You have to, war you have to warm up to prayer. You have, to, you have to dispose yourself for prayer. That means there you are, have, have images that you're praying in front of. We're going to be talking a little bit about the feast that we celebrate today, the famous image. All of you should have some image of Jesus and Mary that, uh, that you're praying in front of. Okay. Some, some picture of Mary that you like. Then you might light a candle. And with that, you're, you're disposing yourself. You then not that you have to kneel down. You might start off by kneeling down for one minute or two minutes. By kneeling down, you're showing God that you're entering into the posture, the attitude of prayer. 
Then you, then you make the sign of the cross. Then say the Hail Mary. Say the Hail Mary slowly, with a lot of love. And if you can, pray a prayer to the Holy Spirit that I just prayed five minutes ago. You don't know the prayer that I said, at least say the glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to pray, is the Holy Spirit, he's the one that teaches us how to pray. We read in St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. This is all, this is all warm up before you hit the soccer field, okay? But these steps, if you don't do these preliminary steps, you may be fumbling and floundering the whole time. Then, uh, then read, uh, read the handout we give to you. If you read, out the, read the handout you give, we give to you, if you read it through slowly with the warm up, the half hour is already gone. Because <laughs> we're giving you a lot of material. So God, God, will, God will speak to you God will speak to you through the handout we're giving you. But you want to go beyond mere reading. So the purpose of the, the purpose of the handout is to ignite some lights in your intellect which will spark something in your heart. And then once something touches your heart, open up and talk to Mary. Open up and talk to Mary. Talk to Mary in your own words. Talk to her. If then you're distracted, go back and read the text again. You're reading and a thought occurs to you that seems to touch you. Open up your heart and talk to Mary again. You're distracted on something, read again. Open up your heart and talk to Mary again. Before you know it, time is already gone. And if you have talked to Mary for a half hour, five days a week, that is a miracle of grace. It is. Which you've never done before in your life. You're starting, and even though you're teenagers, to cultivate a deep, meditative, contemplative, mystical life. I wish I had this when I was a teen teenager. I wish I did. I didn't even know it existed. The fact that you have this is a, it's a huge golden opportunity to establish a solid foundation in your spiritual life. It's huge. I didn't even know this existed. I'm, I'm, I'm a priest now. I wonder where I'd be if I knew this when I were 13 or 14. No? So this is a, a huge golden opportunity for you to establish a solid foundation for your spiritual life. Before you know it, the time's gone. It's already gone. A half hour is 25 minutes, half hour is already gone. Now what do you do? You take out your notebook and write down, write down for five minutes what, what did God say to you in that prayer period? What was the essential message? So Five minutes, you write that down. You'll be surprised at your writing skills, how they often improve when they actually do this program. You'd be surprised what you're going to write down. The insights that you receive, the lights that you receive, you'll be surprised. Okay, then that's important 
because after our talk and our snack, we're going to have, after our talk and our snack, you're going to come together for about 15 minutes, short time. You're going to be dividing into groups, and you're going to be sharing one of the meditations that seemed to really captivate you or touch you this last week. You'll be divided into a group of about 10, and you're going to be sharing for a few minutes. And then it's over, we'll, we'll head over to the church and we'll, we'll end the day. So see, see, the, see this, uh, this month of June, we'll be in July next week, as a month in which you're making a retreat. Retreat means you're, you're experiencing in this time uh, an encounter with God. And if this is done well, this will be the best vacation in your life. So instead of frittering away your time in superficial, frivolous, useless, even harmful things, you're going to be dedicating yourself to God. If you take this seriously, Jesus and Mary are very happy with you. But if you don't take it seriously, they're going to be very sad. Because you're blowing an opportunity. Hmm? Either, you know, it's either one or the other. No? If you take it seriously, Jesus and Mary are going to be very happy with you. And you will experience within the depths of your heart also a lot of peace and joy. But if, um, if you're not going to put forth, you're not going to put forth at least a modicum of goodwill, then Jesus and Mary are going to be sad. And, and later on, when you head toward uh, the latter teen years, uh, you graduate from high school, go to college, you're not going to have this solid foundation. And probably the temptations that surround you are going to overwhelm you. Okay? So I see this as a means by which I'm preparing you for spiritual, <laughs> spiritual battle. <laughs> you hear me? Because I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, 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 you kids, you're, you're going to be confronting tough times. There's, it's never been more difficult in the history of the world for teenagers as right now. I'm not saying this to scare you, but it's never been so difficult for teenagers in this year, 2019. So I'm giving you, I'm giving you tough stuff. If not, you're going to be blown away by materialism, sensuality, eroticism, sexuality, you know, the drug culture, you're going, to be, you're going to become a slave to one of those devils that are out there. But if you're, if you're deeply rooted in Jesus and Mary, you're going to win the battle. You hear me? If you're deeply rooted in Jesus and Mary, in amidst the many temptations that you're going to experience, you're going to win the battle because Jesus and Mary are going to win the, win the battle for you. But if you don't have a solid foundation, as we say in New York, you're dead meat. I mean, you're, you're a dead duck. If you're, not, if you're not prepared for a serious spirituality. You hear me? So what I'm saying in prayer, you, you, just, have to, you just have to try. Give, give, give the Lord 25, half an hour, uh, every day, and the way that we we've written this out, we make it easy for you. Uh, all of you know how to read. I think you do, right? You know how to read. I mean, you just read through it. It's self-explanatory, and it leads you into talking with Jesus and Mary. That's the way I wrote it out. I wrote it out in such a way for teenagers that gently but firmly we're taking you by the hand to encounter Jesus and Mary. Okay, so that has to be said at the beginning of every class, uh, uh, a little bit of instruction and prayer and encouragement. Okay? Now, if, if the first week, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that one of the biggest obstacles, one of the biggest obstacles in our prayer life, and this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, is we tend to be lazy. <laughs> we tend to be lazy, flocal. If this first week you have given into laziness, 
Okay, let's start this week then. Okay, let's start this week. If you've basically you're thrown in the towel to laziness, this week is going to be better. Okay? So if you didn't do anything last week, okay, you're still welcome this week to start. If you did one time, okay, praise the Lord. If you did a couple of times, even better. If you did three times, much better. If you're able to do the five meditations, I mean, I would take my hat off to you and praise the Lord for your goodwill. Boy, I wish someone taught me how to meditate when I was a teenager. Why? Why? I keep repeating that, no? But it's a, it's a great opportunity you have. And look, this is the best time. You're finished school. You got, you got some free time, right? I'm sorry, not free time, a lot of free time. So given you have a lot of free time, use it to get closer to God. Okay? Use it to get closer to God. All right. Uh, before going through our text, I, I really feel it's incumbent upon me to talk about uh, what we celebrate today. Uh, do most of you go to Mass on Sundays? Okay, if you have a, if you have somewhat of a good memory, <laughs> we celebrate Easter, then the Easter season lasts 50 days. After 40 days, we celebrate the ascension of our Lord into heaven. Then we celebrate what is called Pentecost. Any of you know what Pentecost is? Okay, Pentecost is... Oh, it's the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Great, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we celebrate that. And after that, we celebrate the greatest mystery in the Catholic Church. It's called the Blessed Trinity where we believe in one God and three persons. Do any of you have a memory that goes beyond five days? What we celebrated five days ago on Sunday? It's a huge feast day. Okay, that's Latin. Uh, do you, you know what that is in English, Corpus Christi? Okay, it's the body and the blood of Christ. Okay. Corpus Christi would be body of Christ. But it's a celebration of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay, after that, five days after that, the church celebrates another huge solemnity, which happens to be today. So this is one of the most important feast days in the, in the church. I'm not saying it's the most important, but one of the principal most important feast days is what we celebrate today. And for many years, I've always loved this feast. I think you do, too. And today, we celebrate the solemnity of the most sacred heart of Jesus. What a beautiful day to be here. The most sacred heart of Jesus. The most sacred heart of Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful feast day. Okay, so what I'd like to do to honor this, I mean, I have to say something about that, and there's so much, is I'm just going to teach you another way in which you can learn how to pray eventually, is by contemplation of classical spiritual art, okay? Okay, this room, this room that you're in, is basically, in a certain sense, it's kind of my classroom. Uh, I've taught hundreds of classes here uh, since this, uh, this building has been constructed. No? So if you look at the room, the pictures are basically the ones that I like. Okay? Uh, I, like uh, I like, we all have different tastes in art, I think. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they say, right? So I think we all have different tastes for art. Well, you see what I like. <laughs> that picture there is a picture, maybe you've heard of St. John Bosco. Okay? I, lo I love St. John Bosco. He's the patron of young people. Have you heard of John Bosco, any of you? Yeah. Or Dominic Savio? Okay, he's the patron of young people. So he's your patron saint. So pray to him every day. There you have John Bosco with a famous... John Bosco had dreams. 
He was so busy that God had to speak to him in his dreams at night, okay? And there's the most famous dream of the ship and the two pillars. See the ship? Here's a ship here. Then you can see the, the members in the ship. You can see on the top, you got two pillars. You got a high pillar, a low pillar, and then you got surrounded by enemy ships. That's very symbolic of our spiritual life. The tempestuous waters is life with its problems. The ship is symbolic of the Catholic Church, the bark of Peter. The, um, the members of the church are the Pope and the bishops and the priests. They're surrounded by enemy ships, and those are the enemies of our spiritual life, the devil, the flesh, and the world. Now Bosco is contemplating this, and he recognizes that, that ship and the members are in danger, so in a vision he sees these two pillars that ascend. One pillar is shorter than the other one, and it's this one right here. Okay, and on top of it, if you have good eyes, you can see a woman dressed in white with a blue sash, and that's Mary, Our Lady Help of Christians. Then the other one is, you can see that she's actually fixing her eyes on the top of this pillar. And what do you see on the top of the pillar? Okay, you see the body of Christ. So Mary is contemplating the body of Christ. Now, the ship has to direct itself in between those pillars, which it does do, then it changes itself to those pillars. And by doing that, the ship arrives safe to shore. Symbolism, we're in the ship amid storms and temptations and troubles and afflictions. We've got to stay in the ship. Don't jump ship. Don't jump. Stay in the ship until you die. And you've got to focus your eyes on two things. Focus your eyes on Mary. We're doing these next few weeks. And Mary always brings us to Jesus. So what do we do at 12 o'clock? We celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So this is very symbolic of what we're doing these four weeks. Okay, there's an image of divine mercy. Then you have an image. This is an image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the one on the right is an image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which I believe is one of the most beautiful images I've ever seen. You like it? Very beautiful. Very beautiful. So what you could do is you're sitting in front of a beautiful image like that, and you look at it, then you open up and you start to talk to Jesus. Start to talk to Jesus. You look at it, and you, okay, look at the different, the, the different details. Use your mind. You have an intellect. What do those different artistic details say to you? Look at his, around his head you see light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If you ever see a saint with light around it, that symbolizes holiness. That Jesus is the holy of holies. If you look at his face, beautiful face. Look at his face, and he's looking at you with love. That image inspires confidence and trust. It really does. If you look at it, it's an, it's an image in which he's inspiring those who look at him. Trust me. And these are the words that Jesus said. Jesus said these words in the gospel. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. That's taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Come to me, all of you. So Jesus is inviting you to come to him. And look at his eyes. Spend a long time just looking into the eyes of Christ. And you look in the eyes, you probably feel his eyes penetrating the very depths of your soul. 
He knows you better than you know yourself. Think you know yourself? You really don't. You're a mystery unto yourself. But Jesus knows you. Even before you were born, he knew he was going to bring you into existence with eternal love. So you're praying you have an image like this, Jesus and Mary. I mean, you, you're in a really good place. A really good place. Excellent place. You know, Jesus always loves you. And Mary always loves you. We think when we make mistakes that God loves us less. Actually, he loves us more. He loves us more. And that's what the word mercy means. It means God, God, God love, God's love, forgiving and embracing the sinner. That's what mercy is. Okay, look down, uh, go down in the image. Okay, if you look at his, you look at his, his, uh, his hand, his right hand, he's blessing you. But also if you look in the palm of his hand, the lower palm of his hand, what do you see? The lower palm of his hand, you can see something. That's why when you're interpreting art, you have to, you have to pay attention to details. You don't, you don't see it, but there's actually a wound in his hand. That's when he was on the cross on Good Friday, and they nailed his hand to the cross. Why was his hand nailed to the cross? For love of you. For love of you. So when he lifted his hand to be nailed to the cross, he was actually thinking of you when that was happening. How important you are. This happened 2,000 years ago, but he was thinking about you in that moment. I will purposely allow my hand to be nailed to the cross because I love you. Shouldn't we love him back? And if you ever read classical literature, Shakespeare, or any of the classics, one of the greatest most common themes is love that is not responded to. Frustrated love. One of the common themes in literature. Someone loves and the person doesn't love him back and he dies of a heartbreak. It's true. Heart is broken. The thing is, Jesus always loves you, but do we love him back? That's the problem. He always loves you. But what is our love to him? That's the big question. That's why we're here, right? Okay, now if you look at the other hand, the other hand is pointing to his heart. Now if you, you make an artistic contrast, this image here, this is Jesus. But also that's Jesus too. But two different depictions. That's the divine mercy image. In both, you've got his heart. But in that one, his heart is hidden. It's within. Or this, his heart is out. From, it's outside his body. Okay, look at the heart. There's a lot of details there. If you look closely, the heart is once again it's surrounded by light here. As his head is surrounded by light. And what that means is from his heart is radiating, emanating goodness and love and peace and joy. So the closer you get to that, it's like if you're, get, you're cold, you get close to a fire. The fire warms you up, right? You come in the cold day, you get close to the fire, and the fire warms you up. The closer you get to Christ, the more he warms you, he warms you with his great love. Then from his heart, you can see, the very top here, you see, a cross. What does a cross mean? The cross is, once again, it's another symbol of love. 
The course has two parts. It has the vertical beam and it has the horizontal beam. Vertical means going up. Horizontal means extending outwards. The vertical beam symbolizes love for God. The horizontal beam symbolizes love for others. The theological dimension of love and the social dimension of love. Get closer. Okay, below the heart you can see, you can see a flame. It's fire. Jesus said this, I have come to cast fire on the earth. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth. And I'm not at peace until that fire be enkindled. I repeat the words of Jesus. I've come to cast fire on the earth. And I'm not at peace until that fire be enkindled. Now, how do we know that Jesus loves us? Look, there we have his heart. What's surrounding his heart? For me, it's kind of painful to look at that. Because surrounding his heart are thorns. If you've ever done any garden work, probably have, maybe your mom or dad has a garden. If you've ever done any garden work, and I've done more, more than enough my share of garden work, <laughs> If you are in contact with a rose garden, okay, as you have there in Alhambra, a rose garden, you know that the thorns are very sharp. And thorns can be small, just budding, small, bigger and bigger, and they can be very, very sharp. And the heart is a very tender organ. Very tender. So those thorns are actually surrounding the heart of Christ. Not only that, but piercing the heart of Christ. They're touching and they're piercing, they're penetrating the heart of Christ from which, if you get, from which you can actually see the blood is dripping. The blood of Jesus is dripping. That's the manifestation of his love. Love is measured by the willingness to suffer for the loved one. Okay, okay. I, I repeat, love is measured by the willingness to suffer for the loved one. So there you have the sacred heart. Okay, let me mention now uh, the saint. Okay, the saint that had this vision the saint that had the vision of Our Lady Guadalupe is Juan Diego. Okay? The saint that had the vision of Divine Mercy, her name is Saint Faustina Kowalska. The saint that had the vision, uh, this vision of the Sacred Heart, was a French saint that lived in the 1600s. And her name is Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque. Okay. St. Margaret Mary Ella Cook. She was in, in a convent in France in the 1600s, a convent of a place called Paris la Monial. And when she was praying, Jesus appeared to her more than once. More than once. And the, the essential message that Jesus said was this. He said, Behold... Behold the heart that loves so much. Behold the heart that loves so much. And is only received in gratitude and coldness in return. Console my heart. Repair for the coldness against my heart. <laughs> that should break our hearts. Behold the heart that loves so much. Love, love so much that eventually you know what's going to happen to that heart? 
And one of the reasons why you see a wound in the heart, you get close, is because when Jesus died, the nature of Jesus was he was always giving and giving and giving and giving and giving to the point of exhaustion. The nature of love is the gift of self, as John Paul II says. Giving, 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 and giving, and giving. Now, in our case, we can give and give and give until we die. But even after Jesus died, he was still giving. Even after he died. What were the last words of Jesus? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And breathing forth his spirit, he died. There he's dead, but he's still going to give even more. There's a Roman soldier underneath the cross and the Roman soldier takes a lance and he rushes at Christ and he takes that lance and kind of like a javelin thrower goes like this and the lance pierces the side of Christ and the and the lance enters into the heart of Christ it pierces the heart of Christ from which blood and water come forth and here's the word in English it gushes forth you know what it means to gush in English? Not to trickle, but to gush. Gush means, to gush means comes out forcefully. So the love of Christ, even after he dies, he's still giving to us. What? Even his precious blood. Now he said, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. Where is the sacred heart of Jesus going to become manifest? Even though this, this day may seem to be a long Friday morning, you end at 12 o'clock with Mass. And what's going to happen in Mass? You're going to encounter the sacred heart of Jesus. You know when you're going to encounter the sacred heart of Jesus? In the moment of transubstantiation, you ever hear that word? Transubstantiation, when the priest lifts up the host. When he lifts up the chalice. But most especially, when he says the body of Christ. When you say amen, know what's happening? What's happening is you are receiving a heart transplant. Yes. Yes. You are receiving a heart transplant the moment you receive the host. Can you tell me anything greater than that on planet Earth? Can you tell me anything greater than that, this side of eternity? Can you? Nothing, nothing, nothing greater in this world than what's going to happen at the end of this mini retreat at 12 o'clock. That host is going to end up in your heart. And the sacred heart of Jesus is going to be beating in your heart. Can you tell me anything greater than that? You are God's spoiled children. You are. Wow. <laughs> You're God's spoiled children. What an incredible gift that all of you will be able to end this morning celebrating the sacred heart of Jesus, receiving the sacred heart of Jesus in the depths of your heart. How privileged we are. I will ask you a tricky question and you won't get the right answer, then I'll explain why you didn't get the right answer. What is the opposite of love? I knew you were going to say that. And I'll say it's, okay, you're not totally wrong when you say the opposite of love is hate. 
Now let me give you an example. Say for example your parents invite me to your house and uh, okay two different scenarios. Uh, your father has a heated argument with me. Okay. Maybe he likes the the Dodgers and I, have, I happen to like the Yankees and has a heated argument with me and he's arguing with me and maybe he's insulting my Yankees. Okay. Or in, they're in London by the way playing the Red Sox in London. <laughs> And it kind of hurt. But what would happen if your mom and dad saw me, invited me in the house, and threw me in the garage and totally ignored me? I think, the, I think that would be more painful. Treating me like a piece of trash, basically, just kicking me in the garage with your pet parakeet Pete, huh? In other words, ig ignoring me is worse because if your father fights with me, at least he recognizes my existence as a human person. Yeah. But just ignoring me, it's as if, as if I don't even exist. Do you think sometimes that's the way we treat Jesus when we go into church? Maybe we visit the Blessed Sacrament. Maybe we're going to Mass. Maybe we do the same thing. One day you're going to get men, some of you will get married. You know, one of the most most, most uh, painful things in the married life is when your spouse takes you for granted. Do any of you know what the word take, "to take for granted" means in English? Or am I speaking a, a college English to you guys? No. Take for granted, if you don't know what it means, it means not to be appreciated, right? Not appreciated, is that a good interpretation, good synonym? Yeah. Not to be appreciated. Jesus suffers when he's not appreciated. So after, after you go to Mass and receive communion, you should close your eyes at least for one minute, and you should say this, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You're the greatest. You're my best friend. Thank you, Jesus. If you've never said that before, say it today. He wants to hear that. If you say that for one, that, that for one minute, you're going to be on cloud nine probably for a week. And that only took about 52 seconds for me to say it. Jesus has a heart. He has feelings also. If he's ignored, if he's treated with indifference, his heart is breaking. Don't break his heart. Tell him you love him. He loves you so much, but he wants you to tell him that you love him also. That's the essence of the devotion of the Sacred Heart. Is indifference toward the greatest gift in the whole world, which is the gift of Jesus truly present. His sacred heart truly present. Where? He's truly present in the Mass. He's truly present in the Eucharist. He's truly present in the Tabernacle. And who was the person that appreciated Jesus most? It was the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's why we're here. So I think Mary, what can do is pass out the worksheets. We only have enough time. Do they have the worksheets? No, get them. Okay, to pass out the worksheets... And so we're going to invite you to really think about the great love that Jesus has for you, the great love he has for you through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So these are the topics this week. Mary is the ladder to heaven. When I get to heaven, Mary's the ladder. Mary is an example for us. She's our model. Mary's yes and our salvation through the Annunciation. Mary teaches us to love the visitation. And Mary teaches us the true meaning of Christmas.
the true meaning of Christmas. Not simply Santa Claus and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer and that's a materialistic, paganistic interpretation. The true meaning of Christmas. Okay, so all you have your your worksheet and you have your pencil and your thinking cap on. The pictures are great. You see the picture on the, le on the left, you see Mary as queen in heaven, and there's a ladder, and the ladder is a rosary, and they've got these teenagers that are walking up the ladder. That's a great picture. <laughs> Basically, it says it all, doesn't it? Huh? Then the other one, you can see them, they're mountain climbers, and they're climbing up with Mary looking at them, but they're climbing up with the rosary. So you want to climb and make it to the top of the mountain, we have to climb up with our rosary. Ready? Oh, you have your sheet and your pen? A beautiful and poetic title that we can give to Mary is the Ladder to Heaven. Jacob's ladder is symbolic of the ladder of Mary. Okay, what I want you to do, I'd like to tell you a story now. In parentheses, after Mary, I want you to put, I want you to write down, St. Albert the Great. Write down St. Albert the Great. Okay, have any of you ever heard of the greatest teacher in the Catholic Church whose name is St. Thomas Aquinas? Have you ever heard of him? St. Thomas Aquinas is the greatest teacher in the Catholic Church. Okay, years before him, at the end of the 12th century, there was a, there was a little boy in Germany who went to school and he didn't like school. And one of the reasons why is he, he, was, he went to school and he couldn't seem to be learning anything. So what he did one day was he played hooky. In other words, he was trying to get away from school because he couldn't put up with it. And he was climb, trying to climb over this, over this wall. At the top of the wall was a beautiful woman. She said, Albert, where are you going? He said, I'm getting out of this place. What do you mean? I'm leaving school. Why? I can't seem to learn. And then the woman said, well, you can't learn. Why did you ask me and I'll help you to learn? And he said, I can? Yes. So he asked this beautiful woman, teach, help me to learn how to, to, to help me to learn in the school. And that beautiful woman was the Blessed Mother. So he went back to school and he became the best student in the school. Then he went on to become a priest. He became a Dominican priest. And he became the most intelligent, brilliant teacher in the world. He knew biology and chemistry and physics and geometry and philosophy, and theology, and the Bible, every one of those, he was an expert. He was like a walking, he was a walking encyclopedia. And guess who was his student? Someone who would even be more intelligent than him. St. Thomas. Thomas Aquinas became a student who was even going to be more intelligent than Albert the Great. So my, my point in the story is this, we all have struggles. Maybe some of us have academic struggle, struggles, no? Maybe all of you are brilliant in this, but when I was your age, I was a good student, but it, I always struggled with math. Math was tough for me. The other thing was kind of a piece of cake, no? But math, I, I really struggle with math, no? So we probably all have struggles. Let's go to the Blessed Mother and ask Mary to help us with those struggles. 
And she will help you. You do your part. You do your part, Mary will help you. Amen? Okay, next. We are called... We are called to salvation. We are called to salvation and we are called to our eternal destiny which is heaven. Okay, never forget the purpose of your existence. You are here in this world for one purpose. To know God to love God, to serve God in this life to get to heaven. Amen? That's why we're here. We're here to get to heaven. Nothing else matters in this world than for us to get to heaven. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You're a multi-trillionaire and you die in mortal sin, all the money goes to the government, and you end up in hell. Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? You're the poorest person in the world. You don't have a, a, a wooden penny and you die in the state of grace, you go to heaven. That's worth it. That's worth it. So Mary helps us to constantly think, in my life, what, am I do- what I'm doing, is that going to help me to get to heaven? So before making a decision and carrying it in, into an action... Ask yourself, is this going to help me to get to heaven? If it is, do it. If not, refrain from doing it. Mary will help you. Next. Our Lady helps us constantly to fix our eyes on on Jesus. And on the goal of our existence, which is heaven. Mary helps us to fix our eyes on Jesus and our goal, which is to go to heaven. Okay, what are some of the distractions that can cause our eyes to stray from our goal? There are many. One would be money. Vanity, drinking, sex, drugs. These are all false gods that all of you are going to be exposed to them. You already have been. The, de- the devil is going to offer you those things. You've got to say no. Sometimes they are pretty attractive. They're pretty seductive. They're pretty alluring. They're pretty appealing. St. Paul says the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. It's like I give you a a chocolate candy bar, but inside there's poison. The chocolate outside, wow, this is good. But then you bite into it, you got poison. That's where the devil works. Father Greg Staub would say, you know, it's a hot day, and you want to go swimming, and there's a pool there, and you throw yourself in the pool, but there's no water. <laughs> and you crash your head on the ground, huh? You thought the water was just a mirage, no? The devil creates mirages, okay, which are false, lying images. And he traps us. Next. Besides the ladder to heaven, Mary is also known as She's known as the gate of heaven. She's the ladder of heaven and the gate of heaven. So three times we should turn to Mary and seek her help as gate of heaven. And they are, number one, Number one, number one in temptations. Last week you were studying, you're meditating upon Adam and Eve and Mary. Eve had a temptation to eat from the forbidden fruit, and she bit into it. Okay? That was a temptation, and she gave into it. 
Number two is when the ladder seems too high. The ladder seems too high. And number three, when we are on the ladder of... I'm going to give you two words which are basically the same. I'll introduce you to Ignatian spirituality with this word. When you're in desolation. Okay, put in, put in parentheses, you're discouraged. Okay, listen, this is, what else, this is what happens. The dynamic of the spiritual life. Okay, you find yourself in desolation. I mean, you feel kind of sad. You feel depressed. You feel discouraged. No one seems to understand me. Life is a drag. Okay? The, the temptation of the devil, the temptation of the devil often is to turn to some type of, of creature comfort that we call sin. And I mentioned about five of them. Have recourse maybe to drugs. Have recourse to maybe you want to you want to go out and buy a lot of things and you already have enough. Have recourse to pornography, which is really common today. They say that's the modern drug. Yeah. Have recourse to doing violence yourself. How many girls are cutting their wrists? Yeah, don't do that. Why are you doing that? Have recourse, have recourse to going with some bad friends and doing bad stuff. So when you're in desolation, okay, I repeat, when you're in desolation, that's when the devil is going to tempt all of us. Take that for granted. And I mentioned five different ways, traps, that the devil places in your path to fall into. What do you have to do? You have to go and talk to Mary. And if I can say it, you can even cry. You can even offer your tears to Mary. Sometimes that's the best prayer in the world. You're offering your tears to Mary. You know, don't be a, a macho type. I mean, you, you, can, you, you can offer your tears. Jesus wept. Did you know that? Jesus wept three times in the Bible. Jesus was a very strong man. He was a carpenter. He wasn't a wimp. He wasn't a wimp. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus wept when his friend Lazarus died. He wept. So I'm saying this right now because we all go through tough times. And most people, they bail out because of cowardice and have recourse to some type of vice. We have to learn how to have recourse to God with our problems. Got that? Have recourse to God. That's why you're really feeling sad. You go in your room there and you put a, a nice candle and you start to talk to Our Lady Guadalupe. Most of you are Mexicans. Oh, talk to Our Lady Guadalupe. Remember Juan Diego? He talked to Our Lady Guadalupe. Talk. And Our Lady Guadalupe helped Juan Diego save his, his uncle from dying, right? She, she saw his tears and his suffering. So when you're suffering, Mary's even closer to you. Did Mary suffer? We're going to come across that. You know, Mary lost the two people that she loved most. Mary saw the two people that she loved most die in front of her. <laughs> Imagine that. Mary saw that. She saw the two people she loved most die right, right, right in front of her eyes. One was Jesus on the cross. Another one, she, she, saw, she saw her husband die. That was St. Joseph. Imagine how much she suffered. Uh, but she accepted that and she talked to God about that. And God gave her consolation even in the midst of losing the two greatest men in the world, Jesus and St. Joseph. So Mary understands her suffering more than anyone else aside from Jesus. Yeah. 
And I'm trying to teach your parents this, too. It's, it's, it's easy. It's hard. Going through these tough times, go to Mary. And there's no reason why even mom and dad can open up, offer your tears to Mary. It's a powerful prayer. It's happened, and when you were maybe a little girl, you, 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 you fell and you tripped and you, and you scraped your knee, you ran running to mommy, and mommy, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay. She gave you a hug, and you let's get some hot, co hot cocoa, and before you knew it, you forgot it. Your mom gave you a nice hug, some hot cocoa, cleaned your knee, gave you a new dress to put on, out, you're playing again. If your mother can do that, how much more the Blessed Mother can do it. It's true. You've got to believe. Mary's, in, Mary's invisible to your eyes, but she's more real than your mother is. <laughs> she is. Okay, we are confronted with three enemies to our salvation. The devil, the flesh, and the world. The devil, the flesh, and the world. The devil is a liar. He lies to you, and he plays, he plays mind games. Okay? You ever have bad thoughts? We have kind of ugly thoughts? It comes from the devil. Okay? Plays mind games. The flesh means because of original sin, we tend to be gluttonous, lazy, lustful, and greedy. <laughs> We're born that way. The world is what? The world tries to trap us into believing that true happiness can be found here. And true happiness can only be found in heaven. We're pilgrims on the way to our eternal homeland, which is heaven. We are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, contaminated by original sin. And personal sin. Our Lady is always present to beckon us when we, rot, when we, when, when we sin to the three R's. Okay? To rise, to repent, and to return. I like that. Okay? Nice alliteration there. huh? To rise, to get up, to repent, and to return. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? Okay. He rose, he repented, he returned to his father's home. Okay, number 10. The devil tempts us into believing that such a ladder to heaven is only for great saints. The ladder is for all of us. And even if, as Jesus said to St. Faustus, even if you were the worst sinner in the world, you could still be the greatest saint. Amen? It's true. Even if you were the worst sinner in the world, you could be the greatest saint. Here's a tricky question for you. Who was the first saint that Jesus canonized? Well, once I tell you, you're probably going to laugh. It, it seemed to be crazy. Probably see, think someone who was so, so holy. The first saint that Jesus canonized as a saint, who was it? You know? Not, not the devil. The devil was not canon. Oh, well, again, there's a good question, a good response. At least you tried, yes. He was, he was alongside Jesus. Not, not St. John the Baptist. Well, you're, you're, they're all good responses. Yeah, you're the one. Okay, he's on the cross. And he's surrounded by these two thieves. They're pretty bad guys, huh? They're thieves, they're murderers, they're insurrectionists. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're tough kids. They're tough, 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 tough guys, huh? I think the, the Choles of Hawaiian Guards would be afraid of them. I mean, they're, they're tough. Huh? And one of them, Turn to Jesus and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Andrea? Yes. 
Almost. Amen, amen. I say to you, today you'll be with me in heaven. So the first one that Jesus said was going to go to be with him in heaven was a thief, a murderer, and an insurrectionist. Insurrectionist, you know what that means? A Hitler type who started wars. Insurrection means Hitler, okay? Or Mussolini, okay? Guys that would start wars. Or Joseph Stalin, okay? <laughs> Tough guys, no? So he told Jesus he was sorry and he was forgiven just like that. Went right to heaven. So all of us, starting right now, we can become great saints if we really love Mary. And Mary brings us to Jesus. Right, Eric? Okay, let's move on. We're going to be talking about one of the biggest dangers in our spiritual life. Mary's children feel a repugnance for mediocrity. Do any of you know what the word mediocrity means? I wonder if the adults know, okay? Mediocrity means doing as little as possible. Yeah, do as little as possible. My founder said, he who is happy to have a small house in heaven will have a palace in hell. <laughs> <laughs> he was happy to have a little casita a little casita a little small house in heaven will end up by having a huge palace in hell so aim high Mary wants us to aim high got that? okay next mediocrity, tepidity lukewarmness and the low life just going to do as little as possible. <coughs> Get into heaven with my pants burnt, is what my professors say. Okay? Barely make it in. Okay? okay, number 12. According to St. Louis de Montfort, the saints in the last days will be carrying the cross in one hand and the rosary in the other hand with the names of Jesus and Mary inscribed in their hearts. Right? And St. Louis de Montfort. They will have the cross in one hand, the rosary in the other hand, with the names of Jesus and Mary inscribed in their hearts. Tell me, you're Mexican. How did Miguel Pro die? Cross, rosary, que vive Cristo Rey. Que viva la Virgen Guadalupe. No? A Cristeros, Miguel Pro. Viva Cristo Rey, Viva La Virgen Guadalupe. Boom, boom, boom. Died, shot him, and he went right to heaven. One of your favorites, right, Mary? <laughs> okay, talk to our Lady Gate of Heaven and beg her for greatness, boldness, and a passion to love Jesus with all your heart mind, soul, and strength, and to become, and to become a saint. Become a saint. Wouldn't it be great if we had these 75 young people that were all canonized saints? Wouldn't it be great? I'm going to pray for you that you all become saints. Huh? In my Mass, 4 o'clock, I'm going to place them all on the altar, that they all become saints, and God's going to hear my prayer, I believe and Jesus said, ask and receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open to me. God's going to hear my prayer. You do your part too, okay? <laughs> okay, next. To fight discouragement, we must turn to Our Lady and beg her for the grace to keep... What? Keep fighting. Never see the movie Cinderella Man, the boxer, the New Jersey boxer. Keep fighting, no? Keep fighting, okay? Fighting and struggling to be good, to learn more about God, and to pursue holiness of life. 
and to pursue a holiness of life. So my prayer, this is going to be the best week in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's say Hail Mary that we'll really, really love Jesus who Mary and we'll choose to go up that ladder that takes us to heaven and that ladder is Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay.